So what I wanted to study today are disease implications of human sex chromosome evolution. So I am an evolutionary biologist and not a clinician, um, but I do think these things are very relevant. So what I wanted to start with was uh, some of the leading causes of death and how they differ between men and women. So these are data from the CDC, so it's just specific to the US where these data were collected, but we're going to look at the proportion of the population of males and females who are affected by these and, and the, the, the rank order, which is also kind of surprising to me. So heart disease is the number one killer of men and women. It affects men slightly more than women. Number two is the same in men and women, cancer, um, although it slightly affects uh, males at a higher percentage than females. Um, stroke is the third leading cause of death in women, but it's not, it doesn't show up until the fifth leading cause of death for men. So here's the first time where we get a big difference in the rank order of causes of death. And you can see a 2% difference there, but when it's only causing 6% or 4%, it's kind of striking. Um, unintentional injuries are the third leading cause of death in men. <laughs> I was just going to show you the top five, but it turns out it's not until the, the sixth leading cause of death for women. Um, and then number four is uh, chronic lower respiratory diseases, again, for both men and women. And in women, the fifth leading cause of death is Alzheimer's. And just to show you where that shows up for men, it shows up at number eight. In fact, um, kidney disease and suicide um, come before these in men. So what we can see here is that there's tremendous variation in the leading causes of death for men and women. And so there's lots of reasons why we would want to study differences. Um, but it turns out that the most sex-biased regions of our genome are actually fairly poorly analyzed when we look at the rest of the, the genome, the autosomes, or the non-sex chromosomes. And this is the part that I'm, I mean, I'm passionate about studying, the X and the Y chromosome. So if we look at genome-wide association studies, every time you see a genome-wide association study, I want you to go to the methods and look at it, because it's not truly genome-wide. In fact, only 33% of genome-wide studies include the X chromosome, and almost none of them include the Y chromosome. So what do we know about the X and the Y chromosome? Um, so there's these two chromosomes, and genetic females typically have two copies of the X chromosome, and genetic males have an X and a Y chromosome. We know that about 200 million years ago, the X and the Y chromosome were identical. They were a pair of autosomes, or non-sex chromosomes, just like every other pair that you get one copy from your genetic mom, one copy from your genetic dad. And over the last 200 million years, some kind of amazing things have happened. So the X chromosome has about 155 million sites on it and 1,100 genes. And we know that in mammals, there's, there's kind of an addition there that's human uh, specific to most eutherian mammals. So it's slightly larger than it was 200 million years ago. Um, but we know it's quite large. This addition happened to both the X and the Y. But what happened to the Y chromosome? So the Y chromosome only has 60 million sites on it and 23 unique genes. So in effect, the Y chromosome has lost more than 90% of the gene content it once shared with the X chromosome. So you might wonder, you know, why do we still have it? And what's unique about the genes that, that are retained on the Y chromosome? Well, um, some work we did previously showed um, looking at gene expression between genes that have a functional copy on the X and a functional copy on the Y. Um, they're actually quite diverged in gene expression. So the white boxes mean that the expression on the X and Y is roughly equal. Either they're both not expressed or they're both expressed at similar levels. And if the green boxes just show you where the X chromosome is either exclusively or significantly more expressed than the Y copy, and the blue, the Y copy, is either exclusively or significantly more expressed than the X copy. And so this is looking across a variety of tissues in the brain, the heart, the liver, muscle, um, and some uh, testy-specific tissues, and we, we see quite a lot of variation in the gene expression there. And we also think about functions. So um, this table just shows, you can see X-specific functions, Y-specific functions. And for some of the genes that have a functional X and Y copy, if you lose the Y-link copy, there's no phenotypic um, manifestation of losing that functional copy. Um, we think some of these genes, AMELY, um, may actually be on its way out. So it, it actually shows reduced levels of purifying selection. It's been pseudogenized in the chimpanzee. Uh, it turns out there's some human populations that have actually a, a deletion of this whole gene. Um, so it, we may be losing this gene. The unfortunate part of the possibility that we're losing the AMELY gene is that is the sex-linked marker in forensic analysis. So, <laughs> So I would argue that people doing forensic analysis should talk to evolutionary biologists before they develop their markers. 
Um, but we can get back to that. Uh, <laughs> it turns out also that the genes that are on the Y chromosome are expressed, uh, many of them are expressed exclusively in the testes, or they're expressed in almost every tissue. So we think that they've probably evolved testes-specific functions. And if um, you have mutations that are non-functional, uh, lead to non-functionalization, um, you have infertility um, in genetic males. Why is this also important for medicine? Well, we find that mosaic loss of the Y chromosome in your somatic tissues, so not in the germline, but in somatic tissues, is actually associated with an increased risk of mortality um, in genetic males uh, for, for many types of mortality, and also surprisingly for sex unspecific cancers. So it may be that the Y chromosome here is a biomarker where, um, due to instability, you might lose the Y chromosome. Um, in, in those, and the cancer was already developing, or it may be that the genes that are on the Y that have been retained, these 23 that have been retained over 200 million years of evolution are really important. And if you lose them, it can lead to some severe phenotypes. Um, but then we'll switch back and think that most of the genes on the X, uh, forgive my typo, most of the genes on the X have lost their Y partner. And so this leads to some implications if we're thinking about a population. So we like to think about how populations evolve. Um, but it was mentioned yesterday, right, when you see the progression, the march of progression. It's always a male, almost always a male. Uh, but we know, right, at the tips of the tree, when you show one individual, that's not representative, both of the sex in the population or just the diversity that exists there. And especially not true for the sex chromosomes. So genetic females will have two copies of the X, so they'll have 1,100 genes present in two copies, and males will have 1,100 genes present only in one copy. So what are the evolutionary consequences of this when it comes to gene dosage? If we think that gene dosage is really important for phenotype over time. Well, it turns out in mammals, and we are a mammal, um, we have a dosage compensation mechanism called X inactivation. And what is this X inactivation? It was proposed in 1961 by Mary Lyon that one of those two Xs would be randomly inactivated. And then this was confirmed a couple years later by Murray Barr, these Barr bodies. So where the arrows are pointing, um, that ball is one of the two X chromosomes that has been turned into a big ball of heterochromatin, and it lies on the outside of the nucleus there. So um, my genetics teacher, when I was taking it, you could take a, a swab from your cheek cells, look under, and identify if you have two X chromosomes, you would, only identify, you would identify the Barr body there. So it's something you can actually physically, macroscopically, well, microscopically, but you don't need sequencing to see it. Um, and it turns out this X inactivation is a counting mechanism. So if you're an individual with one X and a Y chromosome, you'll have no bar bodies. If you have two X chromosomes, you'll have one bar body. If you're Klinefelters, two X chromosomes and a Y, you will have a bar body. So it's not gender specific. It really has to do with the chromosomes that are there. Um, trisomy X will have two bar bodies. And individuals with Turner syndrome, which is a single X chromosome, will have no bar bodies. So what we, we need to do is try to understand this process, the evolution of X inactivation a little more. Um, and you might think that because you have this bar body that you can observe, this heterochromatic chunk of your DNA, my DNA stuck there, um, that it might all be inactivated. But it, it's not complete. So what I'm going to show you is some work done by Laura Carroll and Hunt Willard in 2005, assaying individual genes and saying, are these genes subject to inactivation, or do we observe expression from these genes on the inactive X chromosome? And we can determine this if there's different alleles on the X from, uh, on each copy of the X chromosome there. And what we see is pretty striking. Across the X chromosome, there's many genes that are blue, many genes that are escaping inactivation on this silenced X, silenced X chromosome. It turns out that if you actually look across individuals, so what I'm going to show you now is nine individual cell lines, um, it's heterogeneous. So what escapes in activation is not the same in every XX individual. And in fact, it varies quite a lot. So you can see some patterns where there are some genes that are subject to inactivation in all individuals, and some genes that escape inactivation in some but not others. This is one of the strongest arguments, in my opinion, for evolution being ongoing. Our populations are still evolving, especially this X inactivation mechanism, and that it's gene by gene specific. But it's, it's become so spread out across the chromosome that we originally thought that uh, it was the entire chromosome being silenced. 
So what we wanted to ask from an evolutionary perspective um, is how did the sex inactivation evolve? Um, was there some interplay between the X and the Y chromosome? Because we know that the Y chromosome has lost 90% of the gene content relative to the X. So you might imagine dosage differences between the sexes would be important. And so what we did is we took um, all of the genes on the X chromosome, everything that's functional on the X, and classified whether it had a functional partner on the Y, a gene, whether it had a broken copy on the Y, a pseudogene, which we think would have been more recent than those X-linked genes that have absolutely no copy on the Y. It's been deleted completely from all the populations. Um, so this gives us an idea of the dosage in genetic males. And then we went through and looked at the X inactivation status, escape or subject to inactivation. And as you might expect, something that has a functional copy on the Y escapes inactivation. In fact, every gene that has a functional copy on the Y is expressed in two copies in genetic males, is expressed in two copies in genetic females. Those that have a pseudogenized copy on the Y chromosome escape inactivation in some individuals and not in others. So they have a heterogeneous level of escape from inactivation. And those that are lost completely from the Y chromosome, almost exclusively, um, are subject to silencing. There's a few outliers here, and those are things that we probably really should be studying because they're um, expressed in two copies in genetic females and only one copy in genetic males. So what is the clinical relevance of studying X inactivation? Uh, the first one comes to mind is uh, disease risk alleles. So if your allele is on the X chromosome and you're an XX individual, you may randomly silence your functional copy and be left with your disease copy being expressed. Or you may randomly silence your disease copy and have your functional copy expressed. And this has been observed in rodent models of fragile X syndrome. So this is a, a syndrome where it's a, a copy a repeat on the X chromosome and through uh, somatic cell divisions, this, uh, you can see the skinny part here on the fragile X, it will increase and lead to a piece of the X chromosome being broken off um, and a, a kind of a sphere phenotype afterwards. But in mouse models where that, that kind of funky looking fragile X is randomly silenced, those mice do not exhibit fragile X syndrome. If we could figure out how to make this X inactivation non-random, it would be tremendously valuable. Right now we we can't. We don't yet know how to do it. Um, it turns out also that we should understand that this X inactivation is heterogeneous within and between tissues. So you cannot sample from one tissue and say that that is going to be the X inactivation status, um, whether it was the X paternal or X maternal that's inactivated. And so uh, there's been some really great work from Jeremy Nathan's lab. This is in mouse models again, uh, where they put a green fluorescent tag or a red fluorescent tag um, on each of the two different chromosomes, and then they looked across it. I apologize, right, we're talking about the X chromosome, and I'm showing you red-green images, and the red-green color blindness <laughs> is on the X chromosome, and I, I, I didn't do this study. But <laughs> if you will imagine with me that I took a bag of jelly beans, red and green jelly beans, and I shook it up, and I just poured it on the ground, this is what the retina looks like. It's, it's patchy all over the place. So in, in the retina, in the, in the mouse, or this is the corneal uh, endothelium, sorry, um, it's, it's just a patchwork all over. However, in the tongue, what I can tell you is that one half of the tongue is completely red and one half of the tongue is blue or green. I am not colorblind, just inability to speak. Um, so this may have implications if there's genes that are uh, important and relevant to taste on the tongue. Um, it may have no relevance if the genes involved in taste perception are not on the X chromosome. And then the final thing here is that um, we want to study the clinical relevance of X inactivation. This is a picture of a mouse brain. And about half of the mouse brain has one X inactivated, and the other half has the other X inactivated. This is, we do not yet know in humans the timing during development of when the Xs get chosen for random X inactivation. We would love to. If you would like to donate your brain, please let me know, <laughs> and we can look at it. But uh, we actually, there's the Brain Body Bank um, here in Arizona, so it's something that I would really like to look at. Um, the other piece about the X chromosome is that the bar body, so the silencing, is frequently lost in very aggressive breast cancers. And so we, we don't exactly know why this is, but we do know that we need to study um, patterns of inactivation and, and reactivation of the X chromosome. Here, so things that my lab are doing is we're continuing, uh, we're developing methods for computational detection of those alleles, those specific alleles, so we could look from genomic DNA 
and try to identify particular genes that escape or don't in a, in a larger population. So the original study was done in nine cell lines. Uh, we would like to look at hundreds or hundreds of thousands of individuals. Um, and also, um, I use the X and the Y chromosome for looking at global genetic ancestry. So we just had a paper coming out um, a couple days ago. A lot of people here have talked about adaptation and adaptive alleles, and I want to take two seconds um, to tell you, since I started two minutes late, that um, what's also really important for medical implications is an understanding patterns of neutral variation across the genome. And so we find that looking at Y chromosome variation neutral Y chromosome variation across populations, there was a severe male-specific bottleneck about four to 8,000 years ago. And I'll just leave you with that, um, say thank you. Oh yeah, there's the, the paper if you like. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>